Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, my name is uh, Abdul Toure. You spell that T-U-R-A-Y. It's quite a common name. Um, today I'm going to talk about neoliberalism. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own background because it is a TED talk and you're expected to talk about yourself at a TED talk. Right? Um, um, I am a journalist and I'm a writer. Um, uh, I'm a published author. Uh, I'm also um, a city councillor in Tallinn. I just recently got elected, for, so uh, I've just started my political career. Uh, I am British. If you are good at English, you'll understand I have a British accent. And, uh, and that is relevant to my own political background, as you will see as I get in, into the talk. So uh, let's get started. Well, uh, well okay. Well, well, who am I? What is neoliberalism and why does that matter? Well, um, um, neoliberalism has two strands to it, and we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but w why it matters, and really the talk should be ta uh, called Neoliberalism and Estonia, right? Because it's why Estonia matters, right? And, uh, and, it, and it really does matter uh, a lot. You know, it, you know, it's one of the most important things that's going on in the world right now. Right? And um, um, I'll come to, to why, but first I'll talk about uh, my own. Uh, political background and my political upbringing in Britain. Okay, so I, my, my political education was, is based on um, how I was raised, and I had a very happy childhood uh, um, um, in England, um, playing cricket, playing football, uh, you know, running around, doing things that children do, reading a lot of books, uh, and, um, uh, you know, it, it was great. I mean, I remember going to see a psychiatrist once, and... Uh, and, he, and the psychiatrist is saying, well, there's, there's nothing wrong with you. You, know, you don't have any mental illness problems. You, you have life problems, but you don't have mental illness problems. And I was hugely disappointed. Right? Um, um, but, yeah, it was, it was a happy childhood. And, and um, I thought all children were happy until I had some girlfriends, and I realized that that's not the case. Um, um, but there was one thing that blotted it, and it wasn't what was happening with my family, and it wasn't what was happening with... Um, my friends or with my school, it was what was happening in the country as a whole. And it was a time when Britain was going through decline. And this decline seemed inexorable, it seemed inevitable, and it went on and on, and it just seemed to be getting worse and worse. My earliest memory is of sitting in darkness doing the miners' strike in the early 70s, um, because at the time Britain relied on coal for power, and uh, the miners could go on strike and we had no power. It was simple as that. They could bring down governments. They did bring down governments. Right? I remember as a seven-year-old going to the sweet shop and inflation was so bad that I would go to the shop to buy candy and I couldn't afford it with the pocket money I had because the price had gone up from the week before. You know, it was that bad. Right? And imagine how painful that is for a seven-year-old. You, know, you can't get what you want because of inflation. Right? So the economics and the politics of the time, even a child would notice it. And when you thought things couldn't get worse, they did. Now, I lived through uh, the winter of discontent, it just shows how old I am, and uh, that was in 1979. And what happened was that the unions all over the country went on strike, um, hospital workers went on strike, grave diggers went on strike, so people weren't being buried. Um, there was rubbish all over the town because um, garbage collectors were on strike. And that's what it looked like, right? And I was, remember walking to school through all this, right? And thinking, why the hell do we have to live like this? What's, you know, what is wrong with people, right? Yeah, there were rats running around. It, it, it was awful, right? And so at a very young age, uh, I came to a very simple conclusion. Socialism is rubbish, right? Uh, or, <laughs> uh, or at least the socialism as it had been tried in Britain. And socialism um, meant two things. It meant... Uh, nationalising all industry. Um, all the big companies in Britain, the car industry, the airlines, um, the oil industry, 
um, the energy in, in industry, everything was put into state ownership, right? The idea being that the people own it because the state owns it. And in reality, that's just nonsense. The person who's the boss of you, uh, you just heard that I used to work in um, the British Civil Service in immigration, and the person who's a boss of you thinks they own you, right? right? So that, 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 that's nonsense anyway. But um, th that was what was done, and that was why the unions had become so powerful and why they could hold the country to ransom. And uh, the other strand of socialism was um, welfare state. Right? And um, um, we still have a very strong welfare state in Britain today. Um, but the, the other strand of it, the nationalisation of industry, that was smashed in the 80s by Thatcher. That's what she did. Right? And that's what conservatism in the 80s meant. Right? So as a teenager, I was conservative. And British conservatism, uh, conservatism is the same um, everywhere. But in, in Britain, um, um, it, means, it means something more. It also means um, supporting the monarchy. So in that sense, all the main political parties are conservative, right? Because they all support the monarchy. I mean, unless you're an anarchist, right? You know, you, you, you support having the queen. And there's good arguments for it, which I won't go into here because I haven't got time. Uh, it also means patriotism, which in this context means preserving the union, not only with Scotland, but also with Northern Ireland. Right? Uh, it meant one nation conservatism, which is um, trying to get rid of the class system which benights Britain. And it also meant laissez-faire capitalism. It means uh, Adam Smith's ideas about government not being involved in the running of the state, which, which is what was, they tried to do in the 80s, right? getting rid of um, the nationalisation of industries that benighted Britain. Okay, so neoliberalism um, has two strands to it. Uh, the first strand is um, the ideas of Milton Freeman. And what he said was that if you want to manage an economy, the only way you can do it is by controlling the money supply. And that means that um, you put more money into the economy if you want the economy to build up, or you reduce the amount of money if you want the economy to shrink, which you might want to do if inflation is building up and the economy is overheating. Right? So, um, uh, controlling the money supply. People misunderstand um, what Milton Freeman was about. And for example, Naomi Klein, who's written a book, um, um, completely misunderstands it and says that it's, it's in opposition to Keynesianism. And it isn't. It is a form of Keynesianism. Monetarism is a form of Keynesianism in the same sense that Leninism is a form of Marxism. It's the same ideology. Keynes said right, that you can control the economy two ways. You can use fiscal me measures, i.e. spending money, or you can use monetary methods. Right? Uh, um, whereas Milton Freeman said, no, only the monetary methods work. You know, if you want to control inflation, you want to control the economy, you can increase the amount of money. That's why you have quantitative easing. You can flow money out of a helicopter to fix a recession, literally. That's what monetarists believe. Now, the point of that strand of neoliberalism is that it's scientific. It's based on complicated maths, which well, I don't understand, and you, you, know, you wouldn't understand unless you are an economist. Right? So it, give, it gives policymakers a scientific basis for their decision making to say, well, OK, we're going to follow this, this policy, and it's based on science. Right? Um, and the other side of um, uh, neoliberalism, for those clever people, they'll understand I don't mean that Hayek, I mean this Hayek. Right. Um, uh, um, Frederick Hayek um, is the guy who's preferred by non-Austrian economists. It's, it's known as Austrian school economics, right? And it's called Austrian school because most of the great thinkers in this field were Austrians, right? um, particularly von Mises, von Mises, and, and Hayek, uh, Frederick Hayek. And they developed what was known as the Austrian business cycle. And so what they say is that economies will go through a recession from time to time. And when they go through a recession, what you do is basically nothing. If you try to fix the problem, you'll just make the problem worse. So all you can do is cut down on the spending, cut down on your fiscal spending, right? and then the problem will right itself. Right? So you don't prop up banks, you don't um, throw money at the problem, you certainly don't spend more on public works, you simply have what's known as austerity. Yeah. So, austerity ahead. 
The whole concept of austerity, which we've been hearing for the last five years, austerity, 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 it comes from Austrian school economics. Um, so this, this is interesting. This is what we've seen in all Western developed countries. But it's a problem. What is it? It's nuts, right? <laughs> Austrian school economics is not based on science. It's nothing that any economist would learn at university, right? Here or anywhere, right? If you want to learn Austrian school economics, you have to go someplace like the von Mises Institute in, in America. You won't learn it at university. You know, they don't believe in science. They don't believe that mathematics can explain economics, right? They reject it entirely. They use a method which they call um, rationalism, 18th century rationalism. It's a very old idea, right? So mainstream economists absolutely hate this. Don't they? they really resent this, right? Now, Freeman had, had more than um, um, just cutting the money supply in, in, in mind. He had a dream of what, you know, let's say fair capitalism uh, would look like. You'd have no public housing, no unemployment, uh, no minimum wage, no department of uh, education or agriculture, uh, no social security, no central bank, no health care, no education, even at primary school le level, no free education, I should say. Education, obviously, but no free education. Uh, no compulsory military service, no child benefit, no mother's benefit, no pensions, no income tax, well, maybe a little. Right? So, you know, this is what we're talking about. Yeah, so this is very minimal state. This is what was operating in the 19th century. If you had a famine, right, yeah, um, the neoliberals would say, well, okay, you know, that, that's, a, that's a market. Yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. So I came to Estonia five years ago and I found an environment here that is almost naturally neoliberal because Estonians have a very self-reliant um, mentality. They're, they, they're like, we should fend for ourselves, right? Yeah. They were talking about if the recession gets so bad, we'll go back and we'll grow our own potatoes, right? This is the, this is the mentality here in Estonia. And it's not um, just because that's the Estonian mentality. Estonians are neoliberal because it's a backlash to communism. Right? And the backlash is, is fiercer here than it is in almost any country that was once a communist state. But there's a problem. The whole point of monetarism, which you remember, monetarism is the scientific side of neoliberalism. The whole point of it is it's a control of money supply. But what do we have in Estonia? Right? There is no control of the money supply. Right? In Estonia, monetary policy has been the same for 20 years. That is a currency board with the euro, before Estonia entered the euro, and before that with the Deutschmark. Right? So it's always the same. So in here, in Estonia, there was never the opportunity to print more money or to shrink more money, to have quantitative easing. Yeah, that was never something that could be considered. In Estonia, monetarism effectively doesn't exist. So what does that leave? Austerity. And that's what we've seen. When the recession came, what did the government do? They cut that back on their spending. Austerity was the only method that was available to them. They couldn't shrink the money supply. They couldn't cut the interest rate because it's set by the European Bank in Frankfurt. The only thing they could do was use Austrian methods. And as we remember, Austrian methods are not science. So if Austrian methods are not science and Austrian methods are being used in Estonia, why the hell does this guy have a Nobel Prize for economics? Those of you who don't know, that's Paul Krugman. Um, and he's one of the world's leading economists. And he's a brilliant economist who's done a lot of very, very clever work using very sophisticated mathematics to state the obvious. Right? Why two countries with similar economic 
systems trade together because people like choice, right? Why Canada can trade with the United States. And he's used very sophisticated mathematics that most people don't understand, right? To explain this, right? Mm. Telling Paul Krugman you're wrong is like telling a um, physicist you're wrong about string theory. Well, he may be, right? But you don't, know, you don't know why, because you don't understand the mathematics, right? But if Estonia is right, that means that the mathematics actually don't work. It doesn't mean anything. This guy should have, should not have a Nobel Prize. No economist should have an eco a, a Nobel Prize. Everybody who ever got a Nobel Prize for economics, it's all nonsense, right? That's why we had the Krugman route. That's why he's afraid of Estonia. Well, <laughs> now, if you're not Estonian, you won't get the joke, but Ilvis means links. But, um, <laughs> um, and that's why the guy was, you know, when he started to hear Estonia was working, he got really, really angry, because it means his entire life's work is a load of rubbish. Right? Uh, uh, and um, there was more to the Krugman rather than just you know, a spat between uh, Ilvis and um, uh, Krugman. These two guys are, are very similar. I mean, they're the same age. They um, um, both East Coast Americans, really. Uh, they both went to uh, <laughs> um, Ivy League universities. They understand each other, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, um, yeah. So um, um, it's almost as if, the, you know, I mean, I, I say that uh, you know, Krugman's background is from Eastern Europe originally. He, he's three generations away. Well, you know, his grandparents, right? So um, it's like um, two kind of immigrant Americans. Um, one went one way and rejected his, his, his ancestry. The other went the other way. And uh, they're having this spat, which you can understand, right? Because they're, they're very similar people, right? Um, um, but what's behind it is that Krugman understands the danger. He understands that if Estonia is right, economics is not a science. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so where does that leave me? Where do I understand? Where does that leave me in my political education? Because you understand, I started off by saying that I'm a conservative, right? And then I moved to being a liberal. Now I'm an um, elected um, member of the city council for the Social Democrats. So how have I moved from you know, the right almost to the left, right? Well, if economics is not a science, all you can do is trial and error. See what works, what, what doesn't. I believe a mixed economy works best, but finding that balance is the key. And I, in Estonia, I think they've got the balance wrong. Right? And, and that's why I've joined the, the Social Democrats. But you know, it, it's shaken your foundational beliefs. Right? It doesn't mean that the Austrians are right, but it may mean that Krugman, all the other guys, all the other economists are wrong. And of course, I'm not the only one saying this. This is uh, a guy called Stephen King has written a book saying economics is rubbish. Right? Um, I recommend you read it. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>